Hi friends, welcome to the Friends of France podcast. In this safe space, we are favored in each episode with the presence of an expert guest from different fields and specialties as we learn about their life journeys, their successes, possible regrets, and realizations, their work, why they do what they do, and even their life outside of work. In here, we tear down common myths and misinformation with up-to-date, evidence-based science and data simplified for anyone to digest. We don't shy away from topics that can sometimes be polarizing or taboo. We normalize the humanization of healthcare and its workers and we promote the importance of self-care and safeguarding your mental health. Please keep in mind that the conversations in this podcast are for educational and informational purposes only. They are not implied or intended to be a substitute for professional medical diagnosis, advice, or treatment. Please always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers regarding a medical condition. Are you ready? Let's go! Hi everyone! Happy New Year! Welcome to 2023! And also, welcome to another episode of the Friends of France podcast. I am beyond excited to introduce to you to our expert guest today, and also about the topic that we will talk about, cardiology. You know, in the first season, we had 26 episodes, and in those 26 episodes, we had many different expert guests from different specialties, allergy, immunology, dermatology, pediatrics. We actually found it quite funny that I never had a cardiologist on when my bread and butter is cardiology and I've been working in it for the past six years now. When I was in nursing school back in January of 2017, I started to work for an interventional cardiology private practice. And during the summers, I would rotate in their cardiac electrophysiology office in Upper Manhattan. I started as a medical scribe and medical assistant, and sometimes a front desk receptionist when needed. It was definitely great clinical and hands-on practice in adjunct to nursing school. I was learning how to speak to patients, how to talk to them, how to get their histories, getting familiar with their medications and what they're for and their dosages, being more familiar with blood pressures and its variations, doing the EKGs and getting to see different rhythms, and also getting very familiar with medical terms and notations. So I was working in this cardiac office during nursing school and I learned so much and my interest in cardiology really increased. But my interest in cardiology actually stemmed from personal experience. A year prior, I actually had a cardiac procedure in the hospital called a cardiac ablation. Around the fall time of 2015, I started to have cardiac arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms. I had tachyarrhythmias or elevated heart rate coupled with premature ventricular contractions or PVCs which are extra heartbeats coming from the lower chambers of my heart, the ventricles. Generally, the cardiologist told me and my mom that PVCs are not inherently dangerous for my age group, but because it was impeding with my daily life given that I was having recurrent chest pains and shortness of breath and dizziness, there were also times where my heart was beating so quickly that I could not sleep on my bed because my bed would rock because of how quick my heart was beating. Do you remember the sound by Young Money called Bedrock where he was like, I can make your bed rock. Like, that was literally my heart. That was what my heart was doing. (laughs) I mean, if I don't meet anyone in the future to fall in love with who can make my heart flutter like that, I don't want it. (laughs) Joking aside, we were given a choice between medical management and the procedure called cardiac ablation. The cardiologist believed that I was too young to be on medication management, so we opted for the cardiac ablation, where basically a part of my heart where those extra heartbeats, those ectopic heartbeats are coming from, it was ablated or it was burnt. So my heart was burnt. Ouch. (laughs) Fast forward to a year later, I was working in a cardiology office and it was just then that I realized, oh wait, I used to be a patient in this department and now I'm helping people who are also having problems with their heart. So it felt like a full circle moment for me and I think that realization really sparked my interest in cardiology even more. So I worked in this office throughout nursing school and I developed a very good relationship with all of the staff and especially the cardiologists. That's why I'm so grateful because when I became a registered nurse after graduating nursing school and passing my NCLEX, I found out that the cardiologists, who became my mentors and like family to me, were actually attending cardiologists in one of the big hospital systems here in New York City. So ultimately, I was able to get the referral to work in the hospital unit that I worked at, which was a cardiac surgery step-down unit. So half of the floor was a mix of general and interventional cardiology patients. So those with hypertensive crises, heart failure, post-heart attacks and strokes, and also post-procedures, such as implantation of pacemakers, defibrillator, cardioversion, catheterization, even cardiac ablation like the one I got. 
The other half of the unit was for open heart surgery patients, like, like cabbage or coronary artery bypass graft surgeries, and also heart valve replacements, which I was actually able to watch in the OR during my orientation. I was in the fount of heartland, of cardiology land, and I fell in love with it. Sometimes I would even flow to the CCU or the cardiac ICU and see even more critical cases of heart problems. Even now that I have left bedside nursing, I'm still in cardiology because I went back into the cardiac office where I was at way back in nursing school, where we now focus more on outpatient endovascular procedures such as peripheral angiograms, radiofrequency ablations, and coronary CT angiograms, so a little bit more away from direct heart procedures, but more so the effect of heart problems on the arteries and the veins in our body, which can result to swelling, pain, ulcers, and narrowing that may require interventions such as ballooning and stents. All of this is to say that the heart is amazing, and it is definitely the reason why we are alive. And because of that, there are a lot of questions about it. It can cause a lot of anxiety and fear and trepidation coming from my own experience as well. According to the CDC, in the United States, one person dies every 34 seconds from cardiovascular disease, truly making it the number one leading cause of death in the United States and in many countries in the world. There are a lot of questions and also myths surrounding the realm of cardiology. What is a normal blood pressure? Is one considered hypertensive after one reading of elevated blood pressure? Should one become vegan to avoid heart disease? If I have a family history of heart attacks, does that predispose me of getting one too? This episode was live recorded back in February of 2022, and February is American Heart Month, so I have the greatest honor of having one of my idols on as our guest expert. Dr. Ali Hader is a board-certified interventional and structural cardiologist with almost two decades of medical experience. He was also an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School, Bay State Campus, for 10 years. Dr. Hader actually currently works in New York City as an attending interventional cardiologist. He is frequently published, contributing to book chapters and medical journals, including Cardiovascular Revascularization Medicine and the American Journal of Cardiology. Outside of the hospital, Dr. Hader continues his education of cardiology online through social media, where he has amassed a total of 170,000 followers, alongside his multiple media appearances and national television. Are you ready to learn how to avoid a broken heart? Let's go! Hello, Doc. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank, thank you so me. much for being with me today. And thank you to Dr. Parikh for connecting us. No worries. Happy to do it. February is American Heart Month. Cardiology is really an interest of mine. And I am such a fan of your work and the things that you do on Instagram. So thank you so much for being with me. If you could just yeah. first please introduce yourself to everybody, even though you need no introduction. Yeah, yeah. Again, thanks for having me on. Ali Hader, I'm an interventional cardiologist. I've been in practice for several years, working sort of in both private practice and academic setting. I, you know, do a little bit of everything, general cardiology, interventional cardiology, focusing on usual things such as coronary stents, acute MI patients, uh, structural heart disease procedures such as TAVRs, heart valve replacements, all the new kind of fun innovation and, and whatnot. And I obviously do a lot of education in the medical realm on Instagram, Twitter, a little bit on YouTube. I'm not as big as you, but um, <laughs> I um, and I enjoy it. So, and that's obviously it's heart month. So happy to join you. Yes. Thank you so much. But before all of that, all of the things you said, there is truly so much training and education that must have happened for years before you reach where you are now. And it is February. And aside from American Heart Month, we are nearing March, April, May, and June, which are the seasons for the MCAT and medical school applications. To become a physician is such a long, long road. Mm -hmm. Lots of that involved, lots of time, lots of studying. Where did that inspiration come from? I think to embark on that journey, there must be this grilling inspiration for you to actually make it all the way through was it like a family member or a friend or a personal experience yeah so and you're, and you're right you know it's a very long arduous journey and i think at the time when you're applying it's almost like you don't even appreciate yeah. how much <laughs> is actually involved for me so my father was a cardiologist mm. so clearly there was influence there yeah. both by you know seeing and osmosis mm. and all these sorts of things mm -hmm. so that was definitely on multiple levels and probably more levels than i think an inspiration for me to go into medicine you know and 
initially, a, you know, was I for sure and thought I was going to be a cardiologist? No, but no. later, but certainly that was a big part of me wanting to go into medicine. And I think you need some sort of inspiration and seeing how, you know, how the life is and how they deal with other people, the kind of things that they do and say, and, you know, just kind of everyday things also yeah. matter beyond just what your expectation is of a particular field. So clearly that was a big influence for me. Yeah, like, I mean, even the AMC says, right, in the applications that, oh, you should shadow a physician, you should do clinical hours so that you know what's the lifestyle that you are embarking on. And given through all of that, the amount of time and money and effort involved, so many missed family occasions and things that you had to reject in order to reach this point. Do you have any regrets and pursuing the field of medicine? It's a great question. I mean, I personally, I do not have mm -hmm. regrets. I mean, yes, there was a lot of sacrifices, but, you know, my perspective going into it was that, you know, I knew this was, you know, you're going to have to make some choices and sacrifice. Yeah. But not everything. It's not like you're never going to be at a friend's <laughs> wedding. You're never going to be at a birthday yeah. party. There are ways you can set yourself up and in a way where it's not all doom and gloom, right? That being said, there's a lot of time. There's a lot of debt. Financially, you know, you don't really start actually accruing a paycheck and, you know, finances um, in your mid-30s and, you know, then life happens. So I, I would probably do some things different, perhaps, right? Yeah. If I had my younger self, I would tell, you know, certain things about just not necessarily medicine because you're when you're in medicine, you're so focused, you're so involved in this bucket, this pathway. The rest of the world goes on. You don't even know, would yeah. know how to function independently in, in mm -hmm. the real world in many ways, right? So I would give myself some advice about concurrently in parallel doing other things to, mm -hmm. you know, things that I may not care about till later, just to set yourself up for more success and less unhappiness and less stress once you're out into the real world, because that's when your life actually begins. And we get a late start on things. Yeah, I agree with that. Someone said doom and gloom with honor. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> And you said that you didn't know that you wanted to be a cardiologist. And now we hear of students who's like, oh, I'm going to medical school because I want to be an OBGYN physician. I want to be a psychiatrist. But all of that, from what I hear, changes when you start really rotating in the hospitals mm -hmm. during medical school. Is that the same thing that happened to you? I know that your dad is a cardiologist, but mm -hmm. you think that had some inspiration for you for cardiology specifically or was it really in rotations that she I mean it, it did to a certain degree for sure um, mm -hmm. I went through different iterations of what I wanted to do and mm -hmm. one time I wanted to do ENT at one time I wanted to do radiology then I wanted to do interventional radiology and you know I over the years you kind of figure out like what is it that you like you like talking mm -hmm. to people do you yeah. like standing in an operating room? Do you like, mm -hmm. you know, looking at images and, you know, diagnosing that way? Do you like office? Do you like hospital? You know, what is the type of things that you enjoy? What's your physical endurance more kind of attuned with? And these, all those little things sort of also add up to the equation, you know? I think definitely my father had a big influence on it, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, but I did also kind of come to it by just, as you say, kind of figuring out what's the bread and butter, what's the daily, you know, there's all the sexy stuff out there of what you thought, think, and certain specialty does, but what happens every day, right? Yeah. That's really what's important. And to embark on that part of this said the bread and butter, just as a quick talk about it. As an interventional cardiologist, what do you think are the top three things that you see every day? That if you answer your practice, you'll be like, for sure, there's these three things I'm going to see this night. Right. So in interventional cardiology, first of all, I will, I will say for interventional cardiology, there's a lot of different types of interventional cardiology yeah. jobs, right? There are some that are doing, you know, 80% procedures and then there are some that are doing 80 percent office and clinic you know so mm -hmm. and there are some who are sub-specializing in specific types of procedures so there's a lot of variation within interventional cardiology more mm -hmm. than it was sort of before but clearly the bread and butter stuff is you know coronary stenting and mm -hmm. pci or percutaneous coronary intervention and that's sort of putting in heart stents that's the whole field of interventional mm -hmm. cardiology began with and the most common bread and butter the most satisfying thing that makes people excited about it is you know when you're treating somebody with acute mi or my Mm -hmm. infarction, right? If you're mm -hmm. having a heart attack, they're rushing to the hospital mm -hmm. with an ST elevation uh, MI. That's when we go in and do our work. That's when we can really save someone's life. We're opening up, you know, basically their occluded artery, putting in a stent, saving their life. Um, sometimes they can be very sick and sometimes you bring them back from the dead. And that's probably the most satisfying and exciting thing that we do in terms of procedures, you know? Um, and then there's also elective, less sick people yeah. who do those procedures as well, which has its own nuances and complexities and so on and so forth. The second thing that I 
do enjoy the most the heart valve procedures like Tavers, mm-hmm. which is a little mm-hmm. bit newer now, becoming yeah. more and more you know embedded in the field as well as it, as it evolved over the last ten years. But that's a lot of excitement. Most new graduates are interested in it, and that's you know we're basically doing um, procedures that were done once with surgery, minimally invasively, and you know all these things are sort of one of the reasons I, I love the field so much. So much innovation, so many cool technology, and I yeah. love tech. I love you know that sort of thing. So there's so much excitement surrounding yeah. what we come to. And I think compared to, I think any other field, clearly the advancements in interventional cardiology, med tech has, I think, far surpassed. Yeah. It's no longer October, but let me tell you a horror story. I was working bedside as a nurse. 12 hour shifts, 12,000 to 15,000 steps per night, always exposed to dripping blood, pee, and other fluids. And guess what? I was wearing skateboarding shoes for almost a year. Because my feet were killing me, I switched to more comfortable sneakers but had to go through three pairs because I would find new stains after shifts. And over time, as the pandemic came, I was too exhausted to think about my feet or even changing my footwear. I was then introduced to Clove, and I no longer had to do the thinking. To support the steps of those who dedicate their lives to caring for others, Clove collaborated with healthcare professionals and innovative designers to create a shoe that prioritizes the needs of those on the front line. These are sneakers designed for healthcare. They already did the thinking. Easy to clean and fluid repellent, I no longer have to worry about those red streaks or pea-soaked socks since I use the same wipes at work to remove every stain. Just this summer, one of my patients unexpectedly bled from the radial artery access site and made a pool of my brilliant whites on the floor. A few swipes with the purple wipes, all clean and with no damage. Plus being squeak free, I no longer have to worry about waking up a sleeping patient. Layered with comfort, sore toes are no longer my problem since the shoes are now upgraded with double the cushioning, 50% more arch support, and a perfect heel pad. On top of this, the grippiest outsole also allows for a fluid channel technology while maintaining super secure footing. And yes, it's 100% cruelty free and vegan. I love all of my clothes shoes and I hope that you can get ready to also step into your perfect pair. Use code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, or visit goclove.com slash FRANZ for 15% off your first pair of clothes shoes at checkout. I am no stranger to seeing patients that can't get the care they need because they can't afford it. Even if they get a medical recommendation that will help them, Oftentimes, medication costs are so high, it's totally out of reach, or they would have to choose between feeding their family or paying rent in order to get the medication, so people have to go without. After living through a pandemic, on some level, we all know the healthcare system in the United States is broken. That is why I am happy to see that mission-driven businesses are now taking an interest in the problem, because it's not getting solved fast enough. Better Remedies is one of those companies doing something to really meaningfully help people with medical expenses, in particular, getting their medications. Better makes over-the-counter medication, think pain, gas, cough and flu, sleep, all the essentials for your medicine cabinet. For every box of Better Remedies sold, they cover the cost of someone's life-saving medication for a month, and this is someone who would otherwise have to choose between food, rent, gas to get to work, or otherwise caring for themselves or their family. It is such an easy switch to make, you get the same great relief you need for 10% less than other big name brands, and someone who doesn't have the access to their meds will get the help they need. In general, it's good to know the active ingredients you need for your symptoms rather than just buying a big name brand. It'll save you money, and because active ingredients are FDA regulated, you'll still be getting the results you need. Plus, if you buy from Better, you are also helping someone else in a big way too. It's putting your headaches, farts, and insomnia to work. And that's something we can all feel better about. I've been buying my Better Remedies products at Walmart at any time I need to stock up. And you can do the same. Everything's priced about 10% less than the big brands, works just as well, and makes an impact on something that is really important and that I am personally very passionate about. Make the switch next time you need relief. You'll feel better and be doing some good. It's just something about cardiology, and I don't know if I'm biased because I've been working in cardiology, but it's just something so interesting about the heart, right? Like, just the whole body is truly interconnected with this main organ. I mean, I actually had an ablation a few years ago, so I really oh, do yeah. have my own. I, have, I do have my own inclination towards cardiology as well, other than just working in the field. I mean, it's the most important organ. All the other organs are yeah. relying on the heart. I mean, come on. You know, nothing without about... the heart. So, <laughs> junior varsity, everyone else. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, cardiology is the best. And that's why I know that February is American Heart Month. There was no other way but to talk about it. And there's no greater art than to talk to you, Doc, who is a master of the heart, honestly. <laughs> Having that said, we are in the United States of America. And, and in this country, heart disease is still the leading cause of death in every area. Men, women of racial and ethnic backgrounds. As the one who understands this organ after years and years of education and training, why do you think that is that the United States continues to have the leading cause of death right. being heart disease? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's multiple reasons, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, heart disease clearly is yeah. becoming, you know, it's the number one killer in the world. And, you know, mm -hmm. in most countries, I would say in mm -hmm. America, we have unique, you know, mm -hmm. statistics on it. I think it comes down to prevention, right? Yeah. We're very good at creating ways to fix things, yeah. but we're very bad at preventing them from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And then that falls into the hands of both the citizens and the people mm -hmm. and the lay people, but also also the healthcare individuals and the healthcare system, right? The system is not designed or doesn't incentivize folks to prevent things, unfortunately, yeah. right? And we live in a capitalist society, a fee-for-service, and this is kind of how things have evolved, right? And, you know, education is a part of it, right? I think when coming down to the nitty-gritty of how people have to take health into their own hands, right? Yes, part of it is physicians, but number one, People have to kind of take their health seriously. They have to go to the doctor. They have to you know, educate themselves either through their physician or just by understanding the basics of yeah. what a healthy lifestyle means, right? I mean, it's, unfortunately, it's nothing sexy or snap of a finger kind of thing. <laughs> People have to get healthier. Our diets are terrible, right? I mean, we're rampant with fast food and mm. all the high saturated yeah. fats, high cholesterol food. And no matter what kind of measures policy-wise we do to try to control that, it's hard. But with that comes access, right? It comes people who, you know, lower socioeconomic classes, lower education different types of jobs it's not always easy to lead that healthy lifestyle right yeah. so part of it is lifestyle diet you know lack of exercise obviously and then part of it is this having consistent um, a healthcare provider who yeah. you're seeing or you know whether it's a doctor whether it's an NP, whether it's PA mm -hmm. You have to see someone to help mm -hmm. you in that journey of prevention right because most time people don't i don't really see the doctor i'm fine but yeah. guess what shit's yeah. going on in there that you don't yeah. know about i see it when you show up on the table you know in your 40s 50s 60s not as healthy as you thought yeah, super agree with that. I mean, when you see patients like in the hospital, right, and who's already in the bed, I mean, there's people with cholesterol levels that are already off the roof, or their diabetic ulcer is like ready to be amputated right away. Mm -hmm. So super agree with that. We're so good at, oh, let's fix this. Let's try to slow it as much as we can. But the actual prevention is, I think, what's really lacking, I guess, like you said, in a capitalist society. And that leads on to like the nitty gritty of things. It's not like something sexy, not something so macrocosmic, but also something like that happens in our daily lives. Like when we sit down and what we eat and if we ever get up from our seat and actually mm -hmm. talk, when I was promoting our live stream, I received a lot of questions. And I think there are questions that I think for us healthcare workers, like, oh, you know, that's that's common sense. That's this or that. But a lot of things outside of the healthcare field is actually not common sense. Um, mm -hmm. I think the general population, it is our job to actually educate. Them. For example, diet. As a cardiologist, as the one who reviews all these cholesterol levels and all these electrolyte levels and all these other markers in our blood tests, what do you think and what have you seen as a cardiologist? What is there an ideal diet the general population must do that's cardio healthy? The diet realm is always tricky, right? <laughs> As you know, if you've been on social media and different yeah. camps, things get very heated. Part of the problem is it's very hard to do studies on diet, right? Because yeah. you can't really do real randomized trials. A lot yeah. of sensational. You're going to find someone in one camp that's going to tell you what's better than the other. But mm -hmm. focusing on the heart, we do have data, you know, really reasonably high quality data as far as the nutrition um, realm mm -hmm. goes. You know, Mediterranean diet, for example, which is a very plant high plant-based diet, mm -hmm. low in saturated mm -hmm. fats, low in animal fat, heavy emphasis on fruits, vegetables, and specific types of fats, right? And that's the diet that we as cardiologists recommend to most of our patients, right? And, and we're yeah. talking about minimizing, you know, what's the bad stuff? The bad stuff that's going to raise your LDL, right? Saturated yeah. fats. So too much meat, red meat, fatty meat, solid fats, right? Butter, tropical oils, and mm -hmm. things that are most likely to contribute to the bad portion of the mm -hmm. cholesterol. Now, look, we think it's unpractical to tell everybody, yes, everyone go pet vegetarian, completely yeah. plant based. I mean, that's yeah. some people that may mess with. I'm trying to take a more pragmatic approach and tell them, yeah. look, you know, what do you eat? Can you reduce X, Y, and Z? Because mm -hmm. those are most likely to contribute to your cholesterol and mm -hmm. they're most likely going to contribute to atherosclerosis. So, so I try to frame it around the concept 
with the Mediterranean diet, you know, try to be heavy plant-based, but tune it to each individual to make it practical and realistic. Yeah, yeah, super agree with that, Doc. We see, like you said, there's so many wellness and <laughs> diet things all over social media. There's ketogenic diet, there's this diet, there's that diet. And then we also have certain extreme groups like, oh, you have to go vegan or you have to go vegetarian. And like you said, it's all about pragmatism, right? And exactly right. And specifically with there's certain foods and that might be healthier, but are not within access to certain social economic groups. There are healthier options that's kind of not so affordable compared to, <laughs> say, a $2 cheeseburger on the street, right? right? So what do you think is the key in educating people about this in a mass way? And I think this also ties onto the fact that you are in social media. So for you, how big of a role player do you think social media is in permeating this information, given that there's also a lot of, uh, yeah, it's, you it's know, tricky, right? it's, sort of, yeah, yeah. it's tricky. You're going to be fed, you know, you know, no pun intended, the information of yeah. what you follow and which flocks. So there's going to be a lot of mixed messages. People get confused. Yeah. So, you know, trying to control that, you know, and you've seen this perfect example during COVID, right? How much, yeah. how much shit has been out there. So there's pros, but there's also cons there. So it's a challenge, right? Maybe what we have to do is try to, the health insurance companies have to find yeah. a way to, you know, have a mandatory communication mm -hmm. with nutrition or an app or something to kind of give little nuggets of information mm -hmm. to people so they, they understand. I think we have to hit it on multiple sides. Social media, like I said, and at least you're going to reach, you know, certain platforms that are saying yeah. the right things or not saying ludicrous things yeah. may have an impact, but I think we have to hit it from multiple different levels, you know? And, I, you know, aside from diet, simple things, and someone mentioned this before, like even simple things like, you know, avoiding smoking and excessive drinking, right? Yeah. Maybe is that easier to do? I don't know, because you're just telling them don't mm -hmm. do this as much. Yeah. It becomes more complicated. But yeah. I would say both of those issues, again, are what you're putting in your body, right? That's yeah. just important. Tying on from the diet and the smoking and the drinking, actually getting out of the chair and i know when we start doing mm -hmm. those notes in the hospital sedentary lifestyle is one of the markers yeah is there a guideline and i think that's also what you and even dr danielle Bellardo talks a lot about it's mm -hmm. like about the guidelines we can't really individualize everybody because we can't do a meta-analysis on every single person in the united states but we have guidelines that we can follow and use as a discipline right when it comes to exercise whether it's from journal of college of cardiology do we have a guideline on how much exercise the general population should have in a given yeah period? i mean there is guidelines the aha you know has yeah. guidelines that saying look you know i tell people look if you can do 30 minutes a day mm -hmm. five days a week of moderate right. exercise right i think the number they give is 150 minutes mm -hmm. uh, moderate exercise a week or if you're going to do high intensity exercise you know it can be a lower like you know it's even 60 to 90 minutes but basically when it comes down to it the whole point is you have to do something so and i tell people look 30 minutes if you can find tw even 20 minutes yeah. 20 to 30 minutes five of the days a week to do moderate exercise right yeah. that could be brisk treadmill walking on a little bit of an incline you know mm -hmm. so you're getting you know if you're huffing and puffing that means you're doing things but yeah, there are guidelines. It's in that vicinity. It's not, you know, it's not like, oh my God, you got to do an hour with a trainer yeah. and this and that. People have excuses for it. But no, you could go literally for a brisk walk five days a week and uh, yeah. you're going to meet the requirements. And that's what I tell. I start simply and I'm yeah. like, look, someone's sedentary, they're overweight, they don't do anything to sit on the couch. I'm not going to tell them to go get a gym membership, <laughs> move your ass or buy a Peloton. I'm like, look, why don't you get up and start walking, right? Yeah. So again, you got to tune it to each individual and what is the, their delta where you can accomplish yeah. it. And you know, there's also data to show that, you know, if you can do more than what you were doing, right? Any mm -hmm. kind of change, there yeah. is an improvement there, right? So yeah, so the guidelines are uh, around that 120, 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise. I love what you said about the huffing and puffing. I think even all of us in healthcare, right? We get so nitty and gritty on the numbers. Like it's all about the numbers. It's all about this or that. But when it does come to number, a lot of questions came about blood pressure. People are scared when their blood pressure is high one day and then low again one day. As the master of blood pressures, what do you usually tell people even go to see you in a regular consult? What is the biggest thing that people should have in mind about their blood pressure? Do they take it every day? Should they check mm -hmm. it twice a day? <laughs> no, that's a good question. I think one of the most important things is learning how to check it properly, yeah. right? Several of my colleagues have 
posted about this recently in Heart Month. And, you know, we take our blood pressure. First of all, a single blood pressure reading should not diagnose hypertension, mm -hmm. right? The guidelines say you need multiple readings in a single setting and over the course of multiple office visits or an ambulatory blood pressure monitor, which they're hard to find these days. You know, they're not done that much because insurance basically stopped reimbursing from them. But basically, it's a blood pressure cuff monitor you put on. It's automatic cuff. It texts your pressure every hour when you're awake, when you're sleeping. It's the best way to check it. But the surrogate for that is if you're going to check it and you're going to check it at home on your own, you know, you got to do it properly. You got to do sitting. You got to have your arm relaxed. You got to check more than one time and get serial numbers of readings and doing it the right way. You know, ask your physicians on how to do it. There's also, you know, um, ways you can Google and video and see if you're checking your blood pressure appropriately. But the number one thing I see is people are checking it wrong or they're basing it on mm -hmm. a single reading. You know, so the most important thing is getting more as much data as possible. Blood pressure is fluctuating. Blood pressure is always going to fluctuate. You know, even if you don't have hypertension, you're going to have times your blood pressure is higher when it's lower. It's a tricky thing, blood pressure, right? And yeah. blood pressure is not like, oh my God, two readings uh, and I have had this for two months, something bad's going to happen. It's a yeah. long game, right? Yeah. Unless your pressure is, you're walking around with 250 over 120, yeah. blood pressure is something that's going to cause problems over the course of time. So you have mm -hmm. to think about it like that. Like, okay, this is a long-term investment, right? We're not talking about like short term issues here. So don't get worried or concerned. Oh my God, my blood pressure is, I checked it. It's 150 over 90. Oh my God, am I going to die? I tell them, no, yeah. you know, if there's going to be fluctuations. Don't worry about it. I think the anxiety of it also impacts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think just framing it to people understand how we think of blood pressure as physicians calms it down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And aside from the long term effects of checking the serial blood pressure, I think another question that a lot of people have, the general public have, it's like looking at it retroactively is genetics. For those who don't know, how much of a factor is a familial history of hypertension or heart disease have you seen in patients who is asking for you for consult? Sure, sure. I mean, potential hypertension, familial, mm -hmm. there's some small component of it, but you know, the actual familial component of heart disease, I would say that we worry about is atherosclerosis, right? Mm -hmm. So that is very, very relevant. Yeah. So, you know, in one hand, you have someone who's 50 years old, they smoke two packs a day, they have diabetes and uncontrolled yeah. risk factors, right? Clearly they have risk. Then you may have a 50-year-old who is very healthy, right? Mm. But their dad had a heart attack in their 40s, their yeah. brother had a heart attack in their 50s, uncle, so very, very strong family history. And we can't always necessarily check for all those features. So to me, those patients are ascertained in a different way. I think we have to be more cautious with folks yeah. like that. I think there is this, you know, we don't know, we're probably going to eventually learn more about genetics in terms of what are the familiar, you know, familial um, features in the mm -hmm. genome that are attributed mm -hmm. patients to that risk. But so we do that, you know, aside from the traditional risk factors like cholesterol, blood pressure, exercise, diet, you know, we may need to take it a step further for some of these folks with strong family histories. Yeah. There may be a role for if you have a very strong family history, and I define that as you have male family members who had heart attacks in like their 40s or mm -hmm. early 50s or female family members in their 50s. That's the situation where you may want to think about this other types of testing, more advanced mm -hmm. cholesterol screening, lipoprotein mm -hmm. analysis, even these calcium score CAT scans. So there mm -hmm. are a role for additional testing in patients with mm -hmm. strong family histories. But atherosclerosis, heart attacks, people who've had stents and bypass surgery in the family, yeah young age, that's mm -hmm. more relevant. The blood pressure part, probably not as relevant unless they've had familial hypertension where patients have had high blood pressure in their 30s and 40s because it's much obviously easier to recognize. Recognizing underlying atherosclerosis much harder. Yeah. Tagging along atherosclerosis, when people go in for their annual health checkup, if people do go, right? Uh, we have heard of people who kind of live their whole life not really seeing a physician or anybody. <laughs> atherosclerosis, we have these lipid panels. Definitely cholesterol, triglycerides. Mm -hmm. Are there other markers within the blood test that you specifically look out for as a cardiologist when seeing yep. well, specifically for the heart? Yeah, there is. There is other markers out there. And again, these are the ones I think about in patients who have strong family histories. Mm -hmm. One of them is lipoprotein A is one of the ones I mentioned. It's a different type of cholesterol formulation. And it's it's interesting number because it's going to be the same no matter basically what part of your life you're going to check it. And we know a higher number infers a higher risk for patients. Mm -hmm. So that's one that we use. There's inflammatory tests. There's a cardiac CR RP. There is data to show that patients who have an elevated CRP, specific cardiac CRP at baseline, mm -hmm. they have a potentially higher risk of heart attacks in the future. Again, inflammation, heart attacks obviously have an inflammation component to it. And there are other types of cholesterol panels. There's other mm -hmm. things that people talk about. The data is still, I would say, not young, but it's still not made the guidelines, let's say, but mm -hmm. I think that's going to probably change soon. And then there's a lot of other investigation going on right now as well. Another non-blood testing I mentioned was the calcium score. This is a low-dose CAT scan that is getting, again, a lot more 
data to back it as an independent predictor of cardiac events, specifically in certain populations, ethnicities, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So we have more in our arsenal beyond just the, the standard cholesterol panel. So that's why I tell folks, look, if you're if you have a very very strong family history, it may be worth you know talking to someone who knows a lot about uh, the more advanced preventative measure testing. Having worked as a nurse in cardiac surgery recovery and outpatient interventional cardiology, I learned that listening is a vital part of the field. But beyond listening to what patients say, it's also important to hear what they don't say. And many times, you can hear this in the stillness and quietness of the room as their chest thumps and rhythms that can range from normalcy to urgency. A person's heartbeat is not only a sign of life, but also a sign of its quality. According to the CDC, arrhythmias, or abnormal heart sounds, have an expected prevalence of about 1.5% in the general population, with atrial fibrillation being the most common. This is why it is so important that we can adequately hear and detect heart and even lung sounds that may be detrimental to human life. ECHO provides smart digital stethoscopes, such as the 3M Letman Core Digital Stethoscope, that help you check for signs of heart and lung disease in seconds during physical exams with unprecedented enhanced stethoscope sound and automated detection. This is all through a quick pairing with your mobile device. This is made possible by features such as having up to 40 times amplification, active noise cancellation, wireless listening, auto-triggered heart murmur and atrial fibrillation detection, and real-time visualization of sound and ECG that you can share as a consult with a trusted colleague or specialist. Every patient encounter deserves exceptional care. Hear clearly and care confidently with ECHO. The virtual space is flooded with so many different brands, resources, and gears made for healthcare workers from all disciplines. From scrubs to pins and even compression socks, it can truly get overwhelming trying to find the best product fit for you. Links to these items can get lost, and the list can get so long that you forget what you actually needed to purchase for your next work shift. This is why I am so grateful to partner with Lumify, the community marketplace for healthcare workers all in one app. Finding the brands you love, discovering new tools, and accessing your resources and communities shouldn't be difficult. Instead of going to 50 different websites to access what you need, you can find it all on Lumify, where over 200 brands, organizations, and resources are united with one goal, to support healthcare workers. As a nurse-founded company, Lumify believes that all healthcare professionals deserve a trusting and supportive community of their peers. In Lumify, you can easily communicate with your peers to trade advice, share product recommendations, and discuss what resources are best to support you. You can even earn Lumify points on every purchase you complete, which you can save for product discounts. Whether it's mental health resources, or fluid-resistant shoes, high clove, or stethoscopes, high echo, or podcast, welcome to France of France, Lumify is trusted by over 75,000 healthcare professionals at the bedside and beyond, including myself. Enter this new healthcare ecosystem where you can get 10% off using the code LUMIFYFRANZ, that's L-U-M-I-F-Y-F-R-A-N-Z, at LUMIFYCARE.com or the Lumify app available for download on iOS devices. It's a one-stop shop, and I hope you drop by. Like we said earlier in the beginning of our talk that the heart is a major organ because it affects all the other organs. But at the same time, we had also to say that, that there's other things in the body that truly affects the heart. And I think one of that is this is oh, the yeah. stress. Pathophysiologically, you hear all those things like, you know, stress, long-term stress. It can lead to certain hypertrophies of the heart. But all of that layman terms, talking about that, how have you seen stress affect the general population in the cardiac retrospect? Yeah, absolutely. Stress has been, I think, well established as an important yeah. contributor to, to heart disease, both chronic stress and even acute stress. Yeah. Right? So we know the mind-body connection. I mean, a perfect example is, you know, the Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, mm-hmm. the classic broken heart syndrome, which is uh, someone who has a major emotional event, someone dies in the family, and they have an extreme moment of stress, and they present literally just like a heart attack. We see law motion abnormalities in the heart and mimics a heart attack, but it's not. And this is all from stress that causes neurotransmitter release, adrenaline release, and other hormones that are basically affecting the heart directly. So that's, to me, evidence that, yes, there's, without question, stress can affect the heart. So 
There's plenty of other degrees of stress that are out mm-hmm. there. And we have observational data to show that higher stress jobs, higher stress situation mm-hmm. equals more chances for heart attacks. So and I think in the United States, we have exceptionally higher stress levels for multiple different reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have data to show that de-stressing things, things like yoga and stress mm-hmm. management and these sorts of things can impact not just heart attack, but arrhythmias and other issues of the heart. Remember the heart's innervated by the sympathetic and parasympathetic mm-hmm. nervous system? That has effects. We have neurohormonal activation of the heart from the brain, and there is a lot more that we don't completely understand. But I think stress is it, – it's sometimes hard to mitigate stress. You know, yeah. That's the trickier thing. But without question, it's a major player that sometimes we don't really – I don't know. We don't really tangibly discuss. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, high stress jobs, you are the paradigm of someone who is in a high stress job. Medicine, healthcare in general, but medicine, I I think there's this amalgamated stress all the way from pre-med all throughout the whole medical journey. But even as a practicing physician, the amount of hours you work, the lives in your hands, I wanted to also mention something that's not talked about very much is the gruesome rate of physician suicide mm-hmm. in this nation. How do you decompress from work, Doug, given that it's such a high stressful job? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And I think the one of the things that I tell folks is you have to be true to yourself. I mean, mm-hmm. look in the mirror, ask yourself, I mean, Yes, you may be busy, you may be stressed, but do you actually like what you do, right? Are you happy where you are, geography-wise, life situation, the employer you're with, your daily activities, you know, is do you feel depressed? I think we have to understand what the baseline is of folks. You know, it may be easy to say, oh, hey, let's find a way for you to decompress or, you know, let's release some of your stress. But even before that, figure out, okay, is there something there that's really contributing um, beyond just your busy lifestyle, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's number one. And there are changes. And remember, we can make changes. You can move. You can find a different job. You can, you know, even if you want to change fields. I mean, the, the, I think these are important things to think about. Everybody has to find what's going to de-stress them, right? For me, yeah. I would find things that, you know, I'm always trying to keep busy, right? I mean, obviously, all the social media things that I do, yeah. different side gigs that I do. I, you know, I have other interests, non-medical side jobs that I do. Yeah investing i do real estate i enjoy obviously family time travel i do you know take i just took a little trip to you know miami with my um, Uh, friends for just two three days decompress play a little golf so for me it's like i can work a lot once in a while a little period of time to do something that i enjoy or if i'm hanging out with family now obviously with my new baby it's it's Uh, different but you know (laughs) you got to just find in in med school the same thing i would have my vacation okay I'm looking forward to this because I'm going to plan Mm -hmm. something here Mm -hmm. and that's how I'm going to find my moment of calm. Right. And I would always remember, okay, I, it's not like I'm into the abyss here. I have something that I'm looking forward to waypoints, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. That's my thing. Yeah. Super agree with all that. Really finding the roots of even just the stressors, right. Or finding the roots of why we are the our leading cause of death is heart disease. And yeah, really all about prevention. And that's one of the main things that I learned today. Dr. Heider, thank you so much for giving me your time tonight. You're such an inspiration and a motivation to me. Thank you so much for joining me in this space. And no, thanks, for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Of course, of course. It and, is an uh, honor. And I wish you the best of luck on your MCAT and um, <laughs> see where your journey Super takes. Nights. <laughs> Saki cardio resting. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> yeah. Dr. Heider, thank you so much. I hope you have a great night. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. We have now reached the end of the story. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Friends of Franz. I hope you had an enjoyable adventure learning about our expert guest, their work, and why they do the things that they do. Please check out the rest of the series available on all podcast platforms. Please also consider following the podcast on the platform that you prefer. Turn on the alerts for new episodes so you don't miss new stories. And give us a rating to support the show. You can find more updates on the podcast's official Instagram at Friends of France Pod or my personal Instagram at Chris Franz. That's without the I because there is no I in team. <laughs> I'm kidding. Someone already took the username. Have a great day or night, everybody.